G'day guys, back with the Outer Circle, and today we're going to talk Horace Heresy Black Books. So, obviously I have the entire collection of Black Books, I also have the Horace Heresy Masterclass book. But before we can talk about these books, we need to talk about the contemporary books that came out in the same time period. So, book one came out in 2012, it came out in about September of 2012, and Milestone, yes, huge. But at the same time that came out, we also got, in July of that year, 6th edition Warhammer 40,000. This big, thick, chonky rule book. And uh, it's not a terrible rule set, 6th edition. It's okay. I mean, these images that we got in the book were the images of the Primarchs we were given at the time. Take that how you will. But what's interesting, if I go through this pile of books I've set aside to record this, is the Contemporary Codexes. This book here, Space Marines 6th Edition, came out at the same time as this book here, Book 2, Massacre of the Horus Heresy. So if I were to pluck out one of these books, we'll pick book one from under the pile. And compare book one and the rules in book one. So the rules section in these books is very interesting. In book one, you have the Space Marine Legion as a Stardis army list or Crusade army list. And that was all the rules you needed to play legions, uh, but it was generic rules. So it didn't include all the special stuff that allowed you to play, say, uh, World Eaters, for instance. So this here is how many pages we got from pages 183 through to 242 so 60 odd pages of rules so keep that number in mind 60 pages we get to codex space marines and this was to well cover off on generic space marines and we have From page 158 through to page 178. And if you include the reference sheet, which is at the very back of that black book, if you include the reference sheet from this codex, uh, that only takes you to page 179. So a total of, well, best case, 20 pages. 20 pages of rules compared to 60 pages of rules, just over. At the same time, the price point here in Australia, there was about a $30 price difference between these two books. And if you bought the collector's editions of the sixth edition codexes, they were the same price as this book. So let that sink in uh, on quality and price. Artwork is a very good place to look as well. Let's look at Ultramarine's Heraldry from the time period. Yep, lovely, beautiful, cool. Let's pick book five and look at Ultramarine's as the Horus Heresy sees it. Oh, but wait, for there is more. Now tell me, what do you think inspired the average gamer more? That, and the associated section on heraldry, or, because I know there's one in here, that associated section on heraldry. Needless to say, the black books are slightly more excessive when it comes to information than these codexes were. But that's not being very fair on the codexes. Because really, if you wanted background and fluff and information on the books of um, the Horus Heresy Legions, you got these. Index Astartes. I've got one through four here. Uh, went to be by my friend Colin. 
And in here, you get to go through and see the earliest iterations of the Horus Heresy, uh, as we know it, anyway, what's recognizable. That is a Horus Heresy Dark Angels Space Marine. And there's lots of things wrong with the image, right? It doesn't matter that he's a beaky, but we'll just say things like the way the bolt gun looks, the, the way out of the power armor, the different types of shoulder pads, that kind of thing. There's lots wrong with it. But these were our introduction. If we go and look at something like uh, number four here, uh, we get, I'm pretty sure we get Death Guard in this one. Double check, that could be number three. Too many uh, Index of Studies books to flick through. Iron Hands. That was a heresy error. Iron Hands right there. That guy. Bit of a bizarre look. That was, that was the Ultramarines. This is back when they didn't even have gold in the paint scheme because gold paints used to actually cost more. Uh, they were all like 30% more for metallic paints. So Ultramarines back in these days were painted with bright yellow uh Golden yellow was the exact color that they used to paint the trim on power armor back then. It was hideously bright. Uh, but that was the time period. I mean, look at the Terminator with his hazard strike power fist. Uh, that was the time period. So, yes, uh, inspiring, of course. Death Guard, oh, Death Guard. That is a Horus Heresy Death Guard Space Marine. And you know, it's kind of recognizable. I guess you'd call that Mark V power armor because he's got well, he's got a bit of everything going on there. So interesting stuff. I mean, lovely Adrian Smith artwork as well. Just you know, Thousand Suns. So these were the books that set the tone of the Horus Heresy for many of us growing up. And of course, these weren't just pictures. These actually had a lot of. Uh, rules in there. So you have showcases on the different armies, different factions. And then you had yeah, campaigns and just random fluff backgrounds. But to me, the Horus Heresy series was taking something like one of these books and turning it into that. Just cannot be compared with. So that's really the background of them. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into the three different trilogies because it really boils down to three trilogies because they represent three very different phases of the game. So we'll do that next. So it's 2012. I'm 23-ish off the top of my head. That's pretty bad sign. The Alzheimer's is setting in early and this is what we had. These were the original black books. This is the Alan Bly uh, primary trilogy. It's kind of like the Horus Heresy novel series, how you had that first three Sons of Horus books that really laid the foundation and just wowed everyone. Very much the same thing here. Uh, these books were excellent, excellent books for the time. And really, as I've shown, be beyond compare with what had come before. This is where the heart and soul went. So this trilogy, the Istvan trilogy, has a clear direction, a clear focus, and a clear scope. Betrayal is obviously the foundational book, and it'll always be loved by me for that. Massacre is the best Horus Heresy book, though. Uh, I can explain why, perhaps, if I have time or I remember, but Horus Heresy book one is very much, it's exploring itself and how it wants to be laid out, and... It's learnt from uh, the Bad Ab series. So in this book, you have all the fantastic artwork. So, uh, you know, you get these sections on the legions and there's the planet Barbarus, the home planet of the Death Guard. And it goes on to uh, have the imagery of the legion. And it's all laid out. So if you have to turn the book 90 degrees off centre, because this is how it was done in the Imperial Armour books. Well, they moved away from that by book two. So straight away, it was a big improvement because going into book two, we got more of a heraldry of the different legions, which was something we didn't get in book one. We got uh, additional units and kits for the existing legions from book one and artwork that we didn't previously get. 
obviously, yes, heraldry and such. And then we go into these full page A4 spreads of the different characters, which I think is fascinating stuff. Um, and you can see like a really plain Dreadnought, like the new Plastic Contemptor Dreadnought versus a really blinged out Legion sort of venerable Dreadnought style. It's very cool stuff in here. Uh, as you go from Legion to Legion as well, like we've got Salamanders here, we actually get a pre-Vulcan uh, Salamander in here. 18th Legion Tactical Legionary, which isn't so dissimilar from their, uh, the colour scheme that they moved to later. But if I grab another book like well, Seven, I'll grab this one because I know it pretty well. Straight to the page. That's a pre-Heresy or pre-Magnus Thousand Sun. And uh, it's a little bit different. Really cool color scheme, actually. I kind of want to make it. Um, so these are setting the tone. Massacre takes everything book one did right, does it equally good or better, and also adds additional units and such. And Extermination book three uh, it's not a letdown by any stretch of the imagination, but it had the strange choice of including the Imperial Fists in there, and it shoehorns in the Battle of Fell in with the Isvan trilogy. Now, I think the reason they did this was that they wanted to uh, essentially put four legions in each book, and if they stuck to that, then they would knock out all of the legions in relatively short order because you would get the Space Wolves, Sisters of Silence, Thousand Sons, and Custodes in book seven, and then pretty much every other book can have four legions. And it didn't quite pan out that way, unfortunately, in reality. Uh, we also got the first proper Mechanicum list in Massacre. We had a Mechanicum list, and this was, again, the love child of Alan Bly. He loved the Mechanicum. But he couldn't really do anything with it. And so the Mechanicum list you got in here was one, two, three, four, five pages. Uh, and two of those, or two of those units were Titans. So uh, one was the Avenger Strike Fighter, one was Thalax, and the other was a Mechanicum Land Raider. So not very much at all to it. Versus uh, book two, again, my golden child, book two, uh, where you get for example, we go Cybernetica list, where you've got warlord traits, special war gear sections, uh, Xilia, Magos, um, Myrmidons, Thalax, Castellax, Tech Thrall, and Secularis, Fleet Support Wing, Myrmidon Destructors, yeah. And then by book three, you have the first complete Mechanicum list, which has Reductor, Tagmata, uh, etc., etc. So really good foundational trilogy. And this is where the Horus Heresy really took off because if you came across from playing 40K at the same time as you were getting uh, your hopes and dreams shattered by the sixth edition Chaos Space Marine Codex, uh, if you're playing Orcs, Chaos, any of those kind of factions in this time period, you will going up against super, super buffed Tau and Eldar and Taudar and Gravgun Spam Space Marines and Chapter Master Smashfucker and all of those things that were well known from that time period of 6th and 7th edition. Well, these got away from that because no matter which legion you were into, whether you were into workless or traders, you used that army list from this first black book as your point of origin. And the way it would work, for those who aren't aware, you would build your army list using this book. So if I skip forward to it you know legion centurion for example here uh you would take this character you would you know pick your troops out tech marines power armor whatever um you know here's your your legion tactical squads for example okay you would pick them out and then based on the legion as a study as you chose such as emperor's children here you would get those additional bonuses and additional units for your Legion. And this meant that uh, there was a real commonality of strengths and weaknesses between loyalists and traders. And the beautiful thing about how they wrote these rules was you never got things for free because you started to get uh, Legion specific rights of war from book two. Primark rules, of course. Uh, and 
with Legion specific rites of war, they were very interesting because they had weaknesses. Do up these art styles in here. Just the love and affection in these books compared to, you know, modern 40K and even modern Horus Heresy. It's just worlds apart. Uh, but let's take Sunder Horus. So in here, there, uh, there is a right of war and it has effects. It gives you positives, but it also has limitations. So you never just got things for free. And this is something that 40K was very bad for. Uh, by the time that these books were coming out, you had the first data slates, the first detachments that uh, by the time you get to book four, the Curians are happening in seventh edition. Well, it was, it was bad because you're getting things for free. And when you get things for free, if you already have trouble balancing your game, how much worse do you think it makes things? Okay, I'll leave that thought with you. Anyway, fantastic trilogy. Uh, we cover the Istvan Legions, the Sons of Horus, the World Eaters, the Emperor's Children, the Death Guard in Betrayal. We cover the Night Lords, the Word Bearers, the Iron Hands and the Salamanders in Massacre. And in Extermination, we cover the Raven Guard, the Iron Warriors, the Imperial Fists, and the Alpha Legion. We have the Battle of Paramar, we have the Battle of Fel, and we have the winding up of Istvan uh, 5. So, really cool book, really cool artwork. Uh, and, you know, time, you get time in the sun for factions that don't really get a lot of time in the sun. Like Alpha Legion, you know they're not getting a 40k codex anytime soon. So... This essentially, for all intents and purposes, is the Alpha Legion Codex to this day. Uh, same in here if I go to the Iron Warriors, wherever they may be located. Ugh, Imperial Fists, you know. And here's a cool thing, alternate colour schemes as well. Templar Brethren uh, versus traditional Yellow Terminators. So people who play Black Templars, this is your proto-Black Templars here in 30k. Pretty cool. Uh, Imperial Fists, pre rogal Dawn, post rogal Dawn. So, pretty cool stuff. Um, I wanted Iron Warriors, didn't I? One of those legions who doesn't get their time in the sun. Just look at the detail in these images. Like, this is why it feels like a proto-historical game. That marine looks like he's been through a war. There is impacts and explosives damage on his shield. Even this guy here, just the little flecks of paint uh, on, on the pauldrons and such that are scratched off and across the hazard stripes. That's what helps lend itself to this time period feel of the Horus Heresy. Anyway, let's go on from here to the second trilogy. So, trilogy number two. Uh, we get book four, Conquest. Now, Conquest comes out just a few months after book three. Book three is coming out just a few months after book two. So the Horus Heresy is cooking here. Every six months, we're getting one of these 300 page long books, novellas. But there's a problem. And that problem is Horus Heresy has to go to seventh edition because 40K goes to seventh edition. So, Three years, not even two years into the life of this book, they decided they hated that edition, needed more money, so they made seventh edition and fucked a lot of things. When we went to these particular books, there was now the problem of, uh, essentially thanks to the edition swap, they couldn't move on to the next project, which was supposed to be Thousand Suns, uh, Custodes, Space Wolves, that kind of thing. The next section was gonna be, um, Shadow Crusade and Kalth, the uh, Burning of Prospero, and I think Cygnus Prime and Thramus. So those were going to be the way the books were laid out. Which would have been really, really cool, but it's not what we got. What we got was this. And these are cool. So what they did with book four was they said, look, we, we have to adjust this new edition. So they, Imperial Knights had just come out in 40k. So bam, Imperial Knights, Night Houses. They come out in this, and of course, Forge World Style Knights. Then they released the Solar Auxilia, which was, I believe, a pet project uh, of Edgar Skoromowski, who is one of the most talented sculptors I know. 
uh, and a really nice guy. So they, he brings out Solar Auxilia and he designed these for himself, but they love them so much that they made them into their own uh, official faction within the game. So yeah, really, really cool. And Solar Auxilia use a lot of like uh, Siege of Rax style equipment. So Death Corps Krieg vehicles and that, and their own custom versions of um, certain tanks that were available from Forge World you got to use. So really fantastic in that regard. It also added a campaign system in. So although it wasn't the book we wanted, uh, me especially being a Thousand Suns fanboy from the 1990s, I really wanted my Thousand Suns. I didn't get them and I was pretty pissy about it at the time. Lo and behold, what I've become today. But a good book anyway. I really like Conquest. It's, I've got a soft spot for it, especially the campaign system added a lot to the heresy for communities who have regular games together that you can play campaigns together. So then we get Tempest, and Tempest is sort of the return to form. Tempest is the Ultramarines and Kalth. It also gives us the Imperial Militia, but there's a problem here. Uh, it, it's actually a pretty glaring problem. It's got two legions. And this is where the timeline of the heresy starts to creep out a bit. Because instead of having all of these books uh, coming out in a timely manner and getting those four legions knocked out in each book, we get two legions in this book and Imperial Militia, which aren't officially supported as a product line. So although we get these fantastic Ultramarines and Word Bearers units, and we get a revisit of the Word Bearers, but it's only been two books since we first got them. Uh, three books, technically, if you include book four as a full-fledged book, and you, and you count uh, Mechanicum and uh, book two, Massacre, as its own. Anyway, I'm messing up numbers, guys. Anyway. You get the solar uh, auxilia ogrens and such, and solar auxilia images in here for militia, because the best thing you could hope for was things like renegade militia from Siege of Rax, which is these guys here coming out of a Gulgan transporter. We'll bring it in nice and close so you can all see. So those are renegade militia from Siege of Rax, and that was about it, what they had for support. If you wanted to go beyond that, you essentially had to go to third parties because it was only 40k Cadians and Catachans really available or Tempestus Scions, not ideal because the price, uh, to build these gigantic armies out of. So kind of a waste. Uh, so for all the good artwork, and you didn't get much militia artwork in here either. Militia is not Imperial Army, so don't confuse the two. We, we got a bit of Mechanicum artwork in here. Not a great amount. Uh, some Knights artwork again. You'd see a lot more of that uh, going forward. We've got some fantastic Legion artwork though. Such as this Felshion or this Sikorin battle tank. So all in all, a decent book. A um, little bit underwhelming. A lot underwhelming. Uh, in hindsight, not one of the best. But not a terrible book either. It's, it just meant that instead of getting extra legions now, they could have added white scars in now. They could have done a revisit of the World Eaters in there as well, and done the Shadow Crusade, put that all into the one book. But they managed to stretch out the Battle of Kelth into this entire tome. Or that entire tome, I should say. Then we get book six. And book six is the, fuck, we're not ready to release book seven. We want to release something. That's what this book is. So, book six is, it's another campaign book and it has some interesting artwork in there. Like you're starting to see corn berserkers turning into uh, corn berserkers and you're starting to see, you know, iron hands and such being iron hands. And yeah, I don't, I don't know how to describe this book. It's like they had a whole bunch of spare artwork left over and they had to drum up some sort of campaign system to throw it all into uh, because they didn't know what to do with it all. And so we get this uh, Black Shields 
uh, Shattered Legions book, which is not a bad thing, but probably not the book you needed when you still have half your legions or a third of your legions unrepresented. I mean, at this time, we don't have Space Wolves, don't have Thousand Suns, no Dark Angels, no uh, White Scars, and no Blood Angels. So still five legions, uh, plus Custodes and Sisters, and Imperial Army, which we still don't have rules for. None of those are represented yet. So it's a strange time to be doing another campaign. And they introduce us to the Knights Errant and the Black Shields, but the Knights Errant are just a single edition. Essentially, you get, uh, oh, let me let me find exactly where it is. It's just easier to show you guys. Uh, we do get additional rights of war, which is something, but okay. So after the rights of war, Army of Dark Compliance and such and some more artwork, Nathaniel Garrow, Knights Errant. Tylos Rubio, Knights Errant. And then generic Knight Errant. That's it. Black Shields. You get some, some talk about them. And that goes into essentially what replaces your Legion as Astartes, which is four different uh, categories, such as Chimera or whatever. Get a little artwork, you get literally five weapons, you get a HQ, uh, a ton of restrictions, one special character, the Man Reaver, who can also cosplay as a Knight Errant, and you get the Black Shield Marauder Squad, and you get some you know really cool artwork in there. Let's, let's give it its due. But that's it, that's Black Shields. So they've really thinned out on the actual content in this book, because most of what you're getting is, uh, is special characters and additional uh, characters and consoles for the existing Legionis Astartes. Uh, so all the little units and such that were released in between books come out now. And I don't hate it, but it's just very underwhelming because of, well, there's still three more bloody books to go before you even get all the Legions. Anyway, that's the middle uh, chapter, and that is the seventh edition has ruined our plans chapter. <laughs> so the first trilogy, the Isfahan trilogy. The second trilogy, 7th edition 40k ruined everything. And we're trying to fix their mistakes because they derailed the show. Then we get to the third trilogy. So trilogy number three is the, we're sort of back on track adjusted to 7th edition. Uh, then 8th edition hits right about this point here. Yeah, that was a problem. Anyway, Inferno. Inferno was commonly regarded as a clusterfuck when it first dropped because it was broken, unbalanced, full of typos, and generally poorly done. Uh, the very weekend that it released at the Horace Heresy Weekender, I believe, was the same weekend that Alan Bly uh, unfortunately passed away. This has major repercussions for that book, that book, and that book. Because Alan was the heart and soul and knew how to play the corporate people. Because there are some real pricks at Forge World. Uh, Tony Cottrell straight away comes to mind. Yeah, I said it, I don't care. He doesn't care either probably that I've said it. Uh, people who are more interested in uh, appeasement of them and what they want to get out of the company. And if they don't like you or your approach to something, they just won't deal with you. They won't help you to do your job. Well, Alan was able to negotiate through all of those people and uh, take all of this as conjecture because I can't show you definitive proof, but those of you who've been around Nottingham know it, okay? Alan was able to negotiate the politics of it all and that's how he was able to get things like this done. Now, the minute he passed away, they were already digging up his corpse to, and it's very not harsh to say, but they were, say things like, oh, he wanted the game to go to 8th edition 40K. And guys, the what ifs, maybes, and could have been. I doubt he really did, uh, because when was he getting hands on with that system when he's trying to get this book knocked out and the guy's dying of cancer? I'm sorry, I just think it's really rude to suggest it but i could be wrong maybe he did really want that it just seems really bizarre to me anyway we're losing track because the background political shenanigans means that this book is being handled by other parties and they are not doing a great job of it 
So we get the usual uh, excellent artwork in here. We, we get our Custodes, Titans, uh, Knights, Space Wolves especially, the, the heraldry and the artwork and all that. It's, it's the same level of top-notch stuff we got. Where it falls down is um, tourists, the tourists of Prospero. Oh. Now I'm, I'm live on camera and I've said it, I'm gonna have to find them and, and show it to people. Why do I do this to myself? So enjoy this moment of the video uh, as I, <laughs> here we go. Some people uh, observing the Battle of Prospero going down, some cameramen, actually two of the same guy, it turns out, I guess. Uh, American tourists watching the burning of Prospero in, in real time. Uh, yeah, this book has some issues. Uh, do, little did we know it was going to get worse. Uh, so up here, for example, let's uh, say uh, Custody Guardian Squad. War gear, Guardian Spear, Close Combat Weapon, Refractor Field, Custody Armor, yada, yada, yada. Yep, cool, respect it, fine, whatever. Sentinel Squad, Sentinel Warblade, Close Combat Weapon, Presidium Shields, yada, yada, yada. Yep, all cool, normal stuff. But we've got uh, additional war gear back here. Uh, but the additional war gear that's that's present on some some models, uh, like their little uh, sword, the little dagger they have, is not actually present in any of these rules, and yet they're present on some units. So it's 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 weird. It's weird, that's all I can say about the rules, the rules writing in here. Sorry, I should really have it properly in frame. Bad, bad host. All right, it's got issues. Little did we know, these two books are gonna come along with their own sets of issues. So again, we keep that same great artwork and such as we go into these books. But when you get to Malevolence, you're getting Demons of the Ruined Storm, you get Blood Angels and you get White Scars. So they're trying to cover off on multiple battles again, so just a single battle. Burning Prospero is big enough with enough different interesting factions to really do it justice, but this is the odd child out because this book here takes the time to give us Demons the Ruined Storms a list, which is fine, but then it decides to re-release, because of all the errors with them, the entire Lydia Custodes list, which takes up a about that much more of this book, which is page 257 to 288. So 31 pages. So that's that's twice or one and a half times a Space Marine Codex from 40K. They could have used that space in this book to put in, say, uh, Dark Angels or they could have used it to revisit Alpha Legion because they're very prominent in this book, the Alpha Legion, uh, because of the shenanigans with Chondax. There's literally a whole section devoted to uh, to, to that uh, and Legion markings and yada yada. There's a whole campaign, in fact, in here revolving around Chondax and Alpha Legion uh, shenanigans and such. It's it's very strange, very strange. Uh, from memory, there was a picture in here of an Alpha Legionnaire somewhere in like a chipped up version of a White Scars paint job, but maybe it's in my head. Maybe it's in my head. Anyway, so you get two Legions in here. You get Demons of the Ruined Storm, and you get a reprint of a force that came out in this book. So weird. Then we get to the ultimate in disappointments. Crusade. Oh boy, how do we sum up Crusade? Uh, it's about that thick. Costs more than this book.
There's a problem here, isn't there, guys? This is gutted of content. We don't have the Dark Mechanic. It would be the main content, I would say, is probably lacking here, or could have been present in the book. The Dark Angels themselves seem a bit half-baked, like they really went into all the different wings of the Dark Angels and such. Um, you know, they spend, they spend pages on the Dark Angels. Most, most legions have a first page, a war gear page, and then some rights of war. These guys are page after page of rights of war, hexagamaton, etc., etc., before you even get to your first unit. Your first unit's like eight pages into the section. In fact, it's exactly eight pages into the section. So, there was clearly meant to be more there because with the units they've got and the interactions at the tabletop and such, it feels slightly half-baked to me because none of it seems different enough to justify its existence. Uh, many of the different wings are objectively terrible uh, and a couple of the wings are objectively really strong in this book. So it's a real contrast of sorts in there. And of course, um, well, you've got one legion and then they have an appendix where they revisit of all legions, the Night Lords, who... The thing that they needed revisited was the terror aspect of the Night Lords. The, the way they caused fear and such is a big part of their fighting style. That didn't get revisited. All they did was added new units and some new war gear and they made them stronger on the tabletop, but they don't play any better as Night Lords on the tabletop, in my opinion. You know, and, and that will vary, obviously, from person to person, but they're not causing fear. They're just essentially Raven Guard with the fear rule. Uh, from these rules, mixed with a bit of Sons of Horus. Uh, you know, hard-hitting, assault force, etc., etc. And you're starting to get a lot of weird things where unit sizes are creeping up to, like, 15 models and that, which has not been consistent for, like, Terminators, uh, a great example. Even Power Armor. Squads of 15 are super, super rare uh, throughout the Horus Heresy Black books, and in here they're becoming commonplace. And the artwork, that artwork there is not the artwork from previous books. That artwork there looks like this artwork here. It's 40K artwork. What the hell are they doing? <laughs> so it's thin, it's tiny. It added almost no new models uh, comparatively. So there you have it, uh, the Black Books from Forge World. This is the Horus Heresy, or at least it was, and now, like Thanos clicking, these dust. Now, there's, there's a bit of a problem there. These are really, really good books as a whole, and don't let the disappointment of one, two, and three there at the EBR back, especially that piece of shit, don't let that, uh, don't let that get you down. There are problems, yes, but overall, compare these books to, to this. And the longevity we have got out of them for the lack of support and, and the problems that that caused uh, for those of us playing the game, yeah, it was an issue, but I got 10 years out of these books to some extent. I got two out of this book. I got three out of this book. Essentially, these books now have become index of studies. They're fluff pieces. They have some interesting missions, beautiful pictures in there, cool rules. But essentially, they're, they're irrelevant and out of date because uh, in their infinite wisdom in turning it into a mainline game, they've decided to burn the whole lot of it down and start over in uh, the quest for money. That's all it really comes down to. It's not to help us out as players, they're a corporate entity. In the quest for money, this here, over well over a thousand dollars in books, has just been superseded. But for what it's worth, I still have them 
I can still play them. I can pull them out whenever I feel like. I go, you know what? I really want to look at the iron hands today. I can just grab a book, open it up, and then bam. I'm looking at iron hands to my heart's content. And that's something they can never take away from me. And this background story to them, the, the depth it has gone to on all these legions, the makeup of the legion, the uh, the planet that they came from, the markings of the legion, the finding of their Primarch and the battles that, that took place with him after they met him, uh, their exemplary battles. Exemplary battles is another thing we didn't really talk about. Uh, exemplary battles are, they tell you about just some of the interesting battles they fought in the Great Crusade. So, that will never be taken away. These books were fantastic, especially that first trilogy. It never hit that high again. It never hit this high. But, damn, damn, they were good books. And this is why people were so invested in the game. Because these books, with all that fluff, all that background, all that artwork, they were able to inspire you. And I mean, just look on the front cover. That is the Horus Heresy and even 40K. It's telling you so much about that universe. Compare it to, you know, an uninspired front cover. It's not terrible, it tells you what it is, but Contrast them side by side, big drop pot of salt on Istvan with super heavies and Thunderhawks screaming in overhead, bullets whizzing past, fiery chasms in the ground from Phosphex rounds and a Marine with a bolt gun. Yay. <laughs> I know it's harsh, but geez, it, these have such re-readability. You can go back and pull them out and just start reading through. I often find I go in to look up one thing and I just read a whole paragraph or start just reading the whole book from scratch when I'm chasing one particular note uh, that I'm making for a video. Uh, whether it's talking about power armor or bolt guns or something like that. I can't do that with this book. The only thing these have, the Horace Heresy books don't, is a showcase. And I wish the Horus Heresy books had a showcase. I really do. And that's when they bought out that really disappointing uh, Horus Heresy Masterclass book, which is anything but. Well, what ifs and could have been? What if Alan was still with us? What might Malevolence and Crusade have been? Because it's meant to be Angelus. That's what the original book was going to be called, uh, which was going to be the blood angels and the dark angels were going to be in that and that was going to be angelus that could have been a really really cool book had the potential but instead they split them into two books and then crusade they just got rid of the entire dark mech without the dark mech in there it was it's half it's half baked look how much shorter it is in the books around it what it's a disgustingly small book anyway I'm back at the Outer Circle. This is the Horus Heresy Black Books and a look back at them. Um, I would love to cover each one in full depth at some point on the channel, but it is not the day for it. Uh, it's Monday night and I got work in the morning and I've got dog training this afternoon. So I'm gonna get prepped for all that. Anyway, it's been fun. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts on the series and uh, any of the controversial statements I made herein uh, in the comments below. See you all next one.